How bad is the Joel Edmondson contract? We look into that and more on this edition of Locked On LA Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Kings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Kings fans, welcome to Locked on LA Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked on LA Kings your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love you to leave us a positive comment on Apple Podcasts if you're a fan of the show. And we're on YouTube. Please like and subscribe if you're enjoying this content. I'm Eddie Garcia, your host of Locked on LA Kings. I've worked in sports media for the past 30 years, 20 plus years at the Fox Sports Radio Network. Also co-host of the Puck Podcast, a weekly NHL review show. That's been putting out content for the last 17 years and a passionate L.A. Kings fan for over 30 years. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more this summer. FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Well, no Kings news to report from over the weekend. No moves made by Rob Blake to add any players. No Arthur Kaliev trade. No contracts agreed upon with any of the restricted free agents like Quinton Byfield or Jordan Spence. Now, our last show, our fan feedback show on Friday, we had a lot of Kings fans chiming in on their disappointment with GM Rob Blake and the moves he's made in free agency. And I talked on last Monday's show about my disappointment specifically with a contract given to veteran defenseman Joel Edmondson, four years, $3.85 million per season. I didn't like the deal in terms of length or average annual value. Other than that, it was great. Uh, but I was curious how that contract stacked up around the league with other third-pairing defensemen and just how bad it really was. And I don't think there's any question Joel Edmondson is going to be on the left side on the third pairing with either Brant Clark or Jordan Spence. I don't think he's going to be a second pairing defenseman. He's not better than Vladislav Gavrikov. He's not going to be on the top pairing with Mikey Anderson, or I should say in place of Mikey Anderson with Drew Doughty. So I think it's pretty clear he's a third pairing defenseman. So a quick refresher on who exactly Joel Edmondson is. 31 years old, left shot defenseman, physical defensive defenseman, He's played 530 career NHL games with the Blues, Hurricanes, Canadians, Capitals, and Maple Leafs. He has 29 goals and 81 assists for 110 career points in the NHL. Now, last season, he split time with the Washington Capitals and the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, mostly with the Capitals. He was a deadline pickup for the Leafs. Played a total of 53 games last year, one goal, five assists for six points. So, okay, you get what he's going to give you. And that's, again, pretty much nothing offensively. He's a defensive defenseman. Uh, As far as the positives go about Joel Edmondson, well, he's a left-shot defenseman, so that's what we were looking to upgrade over Andreas Englund, at least some were. Um, He has won a Stanley Cup with the St. Louis Blues, so he has firsthand knowledge of what it takes to win it all. That's always nice. Uh, He's got a good size. He's 6'5", 220 pounds, and there's a lot of Kings fans who felt the Kings needed to get bigger and stronger, so they did with him. Um, And he is... Nasty to play against. Uh, He literally has the reputation of having the most nasty cross check in the league. So if you thought the Kings needed to get uh, a little bit more nasty, he provides that. Now, it should be said that this might be a bad signing for the Kings, but it's an amazing signing for Joel Edmondson. Now, kudos to him and his agent for getting a great deal. Uh, It is not Rob. It is not their fault that Rob Blake signed them to this deal. Uh, And it's not really fair to be upset with him because he got a great deal for him personally, but not a good deal for the Kings as a team, at least in my opinion and the opinion of many others. But my parents told me a long time ago when I was growing up, and they told me this often, life is unfair. Uh, So it's difficult for fans like me and you to not have a bad taste in our mouths regarding Joel Edmondson when he even hasn't played a single game for the LA Kings. So again, not really fair, but we don't care if it's fair or not. It's the way we're going to feel. Now, I'm pretty sure he's not losing any sleep over that, to be honest, but um, it is what it is. Uh, Now, is it possible that he could turn in or be this mean, nasty SOB, becomes a fan favorite, and uh, you know is is a player that other teams hate to play against? Sure, he could be that. Um, But does that 
mean that his contract was a good contract from a business standpoint, from an asset management standpoint? Well, that's what we're going to look into today. So why do I feel the signing of Joel Edmondson to a four-year deal where $3.85 million per year is a bad contract? Well, let's start with the number of years, four years. Why would the Kings want to sign a player like Joel Edmondson, a defensive defenseman, for four years? Now, he's 31 years old. Um, that's certainly not over the hill for an NHL player, but is he going to get better or worse over the next four years? Now, maybe he stays status quo, but just generally speaking, what's more likely? That he's going to get better suddenly after many years in the league or that he's going to fall off, um, get slower? I think it's fair to say it's more likely than not that he will not be better in these four years. Um, and look, if he was 23 years old uh, and a player that was on the rise, um, then you could understand signing that type of a player to a four-year deal. Maybe someone that's going to get better over the next four years. But why would you want to lock up a bottom pairing defenseman for four years? Again, if it's a young guy on the rise and you think he projects to be maybe a second pairing guy, maybe a top pairing guy with more experience, more seasoning, that's one thing. But that's not the case with Joel Edmondson. His position on the roster itself tells you he's not really an important player. If you ranked the players, 19 players in the Kings lineup, one through 19 on a given night, he's going to be in the bottom four or five of those players, maybe even the 19th player on the roster that's on the ice uh, at some point in the game. Now, again, Jordan Spence, he played on the bottom pairing. And you could say, what does that mean? He's not an important player. Again, he's a different kind of player. He was in his first year in the NHL last season. He's 23 and he's making $820,000. At least he did last year. He's a guy who's going to get better. At least you would think it's more likely than not. He's going to improve. So you can understand investing four years in a guy like that. Again, that's not Joel Edmondson. Plus Spence is a player that if the Kings may be considered moving, because maybe he's stuck behind Brant Clark and Drew Doughty for a while. Maybe you can get assets for a guy like Jordan Spence because he's young and he's on the rise and he's improving. He's probably going to get better. Not the case with a guy like a Joel Edmondson. Uh, so if you're, if you're signing a player like Joel Edmondson, to me, and I'm not a GM and never will be, but I don't think it's rocket science to think that's a guy you want to sign to two years max. So, you know, where does his four-year deal stack up around the league? Are there other teams out there signing a third-pairing defenseman to a four-year deal? Um, well, that's looking at 32 teams at 64 players. Only two other players other than Joel Edmondson have been signed to a deal of four years or more. Scott Mayfield of the New York Islanders is a third-pairing defenseman. At least he's slotted to be. He's signed for six years. Uh, Zach Whitecloud of the Vegas Golden Knights is signed for four years. Everyone else in the NHL that's projected to be a bottom pairing defenseman is signed for three or fewer seasons. So why would Rob Blake sign Joel Edmonds into a four-year deal? I don't know. I, I can't imagine any other team in the league would sign him to a four-year deal. And that's if that's what it took, to sign him. If they were in negotiations and Joel Edmondson says, I got to have a four year deal to come to LA. Then if you're Rob Blake, you say, Hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for considering us. Good luck wherever you're going to go. <laughs> you know, if, if that was the price to pay that it had to be four years for him to come here, then you don't sign him. Let him go somewhere else. It just it doesn't make sense. It, I, it makes more sense to just stick with a Jacob Movarar or uh, an Andreas England. Yeah, maybe they're not as good as Joel Edmondson, but he's not that much better that you're willing to invest that term in him. So there's that. All right, so how about the $3.85 million per season? Of all the other projected third-pairing defensemen in the NHL, are there any other players making that much or more money next season? There are five. Uh, there is Mark Edward Vlasic of the Sharks. He's getting $7 million per season for the next two years to be a bottom-pairing defenseman. It's one of the worst average annual values of any player in the NHL, and it has been for a while. Nick Letty 
is making $4 million per year for the St. Louis Blues, but he's signed for just two years. Alec Martinez is going to make $4 million for next season with the Blackhawks, but he's just signed for one year. I would much rather have Marty back on the Kings for a one-year $4 million deal, and $4 million is a lot for him, and he's had injury issues, but he's a fan favorite. He's a multiple Stanley Cup champ. And it would be it would it would be goodwill, I think. And you don't just sign a guy for that. But again, Alec Martinez or Joel Edmondson, I'd rather have my Alec Martinez, frankly, as my third pairing defenseman on the left side. And again, it's just one year. If it doesn't work out, you say you say goodbye after the season. No big deal. Uh, the New Jersey Devils signed Brandon Dillon three years, four million per season. So he's making a little bit more, but not for four years. Um, he's a little bit older, a little bit more productive than Edmondson, but that, that's a lot for a third pairing guy. And then there's finally Bowen Byram of the Buffalo Sabres. Like Edmondson, he is making $3.85 million per season, but it's only for one season. He's 23 years old, and he had 29 points last year with 11 goals. So again, he's kind of more on the Jordan Spence kind of a role. So in terms of money per season and length of contract, it's too much for too long. For Joel Edmondson, even taking into consideration, you know, did the Kings upgrade at that position? I would say if they have, it's not that much more. It's not significantly more. It's not so much so that you would pay someone that much money for that many years. It's not. Um, That's the kind of money you pay for a second pairing guy. Um, So are we talking about, you know, the, the last player on your roster making that kind of money? He's not giving you anything offensively. He's okay defensively. Yeah, he's got good size, you know, but is he is he a, a significant upgrade over Andreas England? I know there are a lot of Kings fans out there that were down on Andreas England. I wasn't one of them because I think he gave the Kings what was expected. Uh, he was a defensive defenseman. He could hit. He dropped the gloves, had some pretty good size but he wasn't going to give you anything offensively. That's kind of what Joel Edmondson is. Maybe a little bit better defensively, um, but not significantly so that you're going to pay him, you know, almost three more million dollars a year and sign him for three more years than you have Andreas England for. Uh, it's it's not money well spent, in my opinion. I think the evidence suggested it's not just an opinion. It's showing you why it wasn't a good signing and, Frankly, that's why a lot of people are upset right now. One of the reasons why a lot of Kings fans are upset with Rob Blake. So what's left for the LA Kings? If they do want to add a player, what specific names are out there? We'll give you those names next here on Locked on LA Kings, your team every day. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open up the app and dream up any bets I'm in the mood for Major League Baseball, golf, soccer, NASCAR. It's never too early to get some bets down as well on your favorite NFL team for the upcoming season. Now, I know what you're thinking. Sports betting is not yet legal in California. However, you can still sign up at FanDuel, browse the latest betting odds of your favorite sports and teams on the Sportsbook app, and get in on the action from anywhere with their free games featuring real cash prizes. No matter where you are in the Golden State, there'll be plenty of options to back the underdog or the favorite when sports betting becomes available. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There is something for everyone every day all summer long. So head on over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Well, I think it's fair to say, judging by the comments and reactions of fans uh, and media alike, that the Kings were very underwhelming in free agency. But is there anyone else of note that the Kings could still add at this point? Now, according to capfriendly.com, the Kings have $9.935 million in cap space available. However, the Kings still have to re-sign restricted free agents, Quentin Byfield, Jordan Spence, Arthur Kaliev, and Eric Portillo. But if if there is some money left over where they could sign a veteran forward who could give them some offense on the third line. There are a few names out there that you might be familiar with. How realistic they are is another, is another question. Um, but, but I would say the top guy out there, um, is 16 year NHL veteran, Max Pacioretty. Uh, he had a, his last contract in Washington was one year, $4 million, a $2 million cap hit. Uh, his last contract I mentioned, um, he's 35 years old. 
and he has had a lot of injury issues lately. He hasn't played more than 70 games in a season since he played 71 for the Vegas Golden Knights back in the 2019-20 season. Now, he did score 32 goals that season, and he followed it up with a 24-goal season in just 48 games. However, in the last three seasons, because of a lot of injuries, he's played a total of 91 games and scored a total of 26 goals. Now, if he's healthy, and that's a big if, he could give you close to 20 goals as a third-line winger, I think, um, but he would have to stay healthy, and that's obviously something he hasn't shown he can do lately, which explains why he's available. Might he be worth the risk at the right price for the LA Kings? Again, you're taking a risk on a player who can't stay healthy, but when he is healthy, he's productive. Might be the type of guy the Kings are having to settle for uh, at this point. Obviously, if you're Max Patch, you're ready. You know your career is about over, so you're going to take whatever the best deal is possible. Whether that could come for the Kings or not, that's in question. Tyler Johnson's a 33-year-old forward. He's a 12-year veteran. He has uh, had a 20-goal season three times in his career. Had uh, Twice, he scored 29 goals in a season for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Last season with a very bad Chicago Blackhawks team, he had 17 goals and 31 points in 67 games, so not bad. Um, just wrapped up a seven-year deal he signed with Tampa back in 2017 that paid him $35 million, $5 million per year, and he ended up being eventually traded to Chicago uh, about uh, four years into that deal with Tampa Bay. So he's available. Mike Hoffman's a 34-year-old winger. He has always been able to put the puck in the net pretty consistently. He has had 20 and 30 goal seasons most of his career, but his production is now declining over the past few seasons as he's gotten older and he's had a reduced role on some bad teams. Last year, 66 games for the worst team in the league, the San Jose Sharks. He had 10 goals and 23 points. Uh, he just wrapped up a three-year, $13 million deal that he signed with the Montreal Canadiens back in 2021 that paid him $4.5 million per season. He was part of a three-team deal that saw him shipped off to San Jose back in 2023. Dominique Kubalik is a 28-year-old former Kings draft pick taken in the seventh round by LA back in 2013. For some reason, he didn't want to play for the Kings and told him he wasn't going to sign with them. So the Kings ended up being forced to trade him to the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, he has since bounced around with stops in Detroit. Last season, he was in Ottawa. Did have a 30-goal season in Chicago, had a 20-goal season in Detroit. Um, certainly not bad for a seventh rounder, but lately his numbers have not been impressive. 74 games with the Senators last season. He had 11 goals and 15 points. Uh, it would be interesting to see him return to L.A. and finally put on a King sweater 12 years after they had drafted him. And former King Tanner Pearson is floating around out there. I really only mentioned him because he's a former King, uh, former first-round pick of L.A. back in 2012, part of the 2014 Stanley Cup winning team. Last season, another injury-filled season for him. Uh, just five goals and 13 points in 54 games, mostly playing on a fourth line for a bad Montreal Canadiens team. He's coming off a three-year deal worth $9.75 million, making $3.25 million per year with the Vancouver Canucks who then traded him to Montreal. Maybe some good luck and some health and the desire to come back home and finish up his career in L.A. That could be maybe the right mix for him to squeeze one more decent season out, but seems unlikely. Tanner Pearson's had a lot of bad luck lately with injuries. So all these guys we've talked about, Max Pacioretty, Tyler Johnson, Mike Hoffman, Dominique Kubelik, Tanner Pearson, these are the type of guys that are left, and they've all got their warts. They're old. They're aging. They've got injury issues. Their production is tailing off. Um, so again, I think patchy or any of that list would be probably the best gamble, but this is an example of what's left for the LA Kings. It's not great. Um, but again, when you, uh, when you wait this long to try and upgrade and you're not getting in on some of the top players early on, then uh, that's what you're left with. So that's, if you're wondering what exactly was out there left for the LA Kings, that's the type of players that are out there for the LA Kings. So with free agency, with the draft, we haven't had time to get into the Kings schedule, which has been released for next season. We're going to do that next here on Locked on LA Kings, your team every day. Drive passion and patience. What brings home the winning trophy also is what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whatever you're into, speed, power, style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, 
your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay's guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. So the Kings and the NHL released the 2014, 20, 2014, 2024, 2025 schedule. Uh, as we record this show, we are 94 days away from the start of the next NHL season. And uh, if you didn't see the schedule, well, the Kings will open up the season with a tough road trip right out of the gate. I'm not sure if this is tied to the upgrades at Crypto.com Arena that is causing the Kings to not have any home preseason games or not, but I I would tend to think it probably is. Um, but the Kings will start the season with seven straight games on the road, and it's a road trip that will span across the entire country. Uh, the Kings' season opener is Thursday, October 10th in Buffalo against the Sabres. Uh, that's where we're going to get our look at the Kings' new uniforms in, in real games that count, so that'll be cool. Uh, that's followed by games in Boston, Ottawa, Toronto, and Montreal. Then it's back west, but still on the road, for games in Anaheim and Las Vegas before finally playing the Kings home opener Thursday, October 24th against the San Jose Sharks and number one overall pick Macklin Celebrini and also former King Carl Grundstrom uh, will be facing his old team as well. Uh, that game against the Ducks, by the way, is on October 20th and that's the first of four freeway faceoff matchups against Anaheim. Kings will host the Utah Hockey Club for the first time ever on Saturday, October 26th. December 22nd, the Kings will be in D.C. to face former Kings Matt Roy and Pierre-Luc Dubois. For the first time, that will also be the first opportunity for new Kings goalie Darcy Kemper to face his old team as well. Kings won't see the team that eliminated them from the playoffs the last three years in a row, the Edmonton Oilers and former King Victor Arvidsson, until December the 28th when the Kings host the Oilers. On January 13th, the Kings make their first trip to Edmonton. And the Kings' third and final regular season game against Edmonton will be in L.A. on April the 5th. On January 22nd and 29th, Kings will take on the defending Stanley Cup champion Florida Panthers with the first game in L.A. and the second game in Florida. March the 13th is a game you might want to circle on your calendar with Matt Roy and Pierre-Luc Dubois making their returns to Los Angeles. April 3rd will be the Kings' first and only regular season game in Utah. And the Kings' final home game of the season, Saturday, April the 12th, uh, their final regular season game of the year will be Tuesday, April the 15th in Seattle. So there you go. That's uh, some, some notes uh, on the upcoming season for the LA Kings. On a personal note, uh, I did see the Kings will play 17 of their 41 home games on Saturday evenings. Uh, that is the day that works best for me to attend games in person. So I'm kind of excited about that. So we should have 17 chances to meet up with Locked On LA Kings listeners, something I really enjoyed doing uh, this past season and had a great time. Um, and I will say tentatively, we will plan to have a Locked On LA Kings meetup before the Kings first Saturday home game. That would be October 26th against Utah. Uh, one of our everydayers, Jim in Lakewood, has offered his home to host uh, an L.A. Kings watch road watch party or two. Um, and that would be awesome to uh, to hook up with some of our everydayers to come over to his house and watch a little hockey. Um, the Kings first road game on the road uh, as far as a Saturday would be the second game of the season in Boston. And I know Jim is a kind of a transplanted Bruins fan in LA. So he'd probably enjoy that, but it's also a 10 AM Pacific time game. So maybe a bit too early. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but like I said, it's, it's already fun to kind of think ahead about next season. Look forward to some of the games we're going to play. Even if maybe you're not the most optimistic Kings fan in the world at this point, there's still a lot of interesting questions to be answered specifically. How is Jim Hiller going to look as Kings head coach? How is the team going to look different? Um, how is being a bigger, tougher team, with guys like Tanner Janot and Joel Edmondson, how is that going to translate into a team that is tougher to play against? And of course, I think the biggest thing people are looking for, how are the young guys either going to take the next step or 
you know, show that they are legitimate NHL players. Uh, Quentin Byfield looking to take a next step. Jordan Spence, Brant Clark joining the NHL. Alex Turcotte, Akil Thomas, uh, Alex Laferriere. How are these guys going to continue to grow and turn into contributors for the LA Kings? Certainly that is something to look forward to for next season. All right, for you everydayers, those of you that listen and watch Locked on LA Kings every day, coming up on Tuesday's show, we'll take a quick peek around the Pacific Division and see where the Kings stand right now against other NHL teams and the moves they've made in the offseason to get better or not. Uh, on Wednesday, Austin Stanovich of the Hockey News, who covers the LA Kings, will join us to give his thoughts on the Kings offseason so far. And of course, on Friday, as always, we'll have our Kings fan feedback show. Anything on your mind involving the LA Kings, your chance to sound off or ask any questions. The email address to get in on that is lockedoneddie at gmail.com, E D D I E. Uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, love for, love for you to leave your comments in the comment section uh, as well. Helps the algorithm, helps people find the show on YouTube. So we really appreciate that. All the likes, all the subscribes, all the comments. Uh, and would love you to stay connected with the show on social media, X, Twitter, Instagram. We are at Locked On LA Kings. I'm Eddie Garcia. Thank you as always for listening and watching this episode of Locked On LA Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Have a great rest of your day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. And as always, go Kings, go.